Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello, everyone, and how are you doing today? Thank you so much for being here and checking in with me with Insurance Hour. Remember, you can reach me anytime at 559-656-0317 with any insurance-related question. You can also send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. Or if you are very eager, you can just dial pound 250 on your cell phone, use keyword insurance, and that should get you to a broker right away. Also, I am happy to say we are now syndicated across California reaching over 30 million people. So once again, I thank you for listening and watching and being interested in taking charge of your insurance. Today, we have a special guest that we have. I wanted to bring someone in to talk a little bit about how insurance is working on the back end to some extent and how it interacts with the crossroads of consumers. So I have special guest Cody Eddings today, and I'd like to welcome him, and then we're gonna have a conversation. Cody, welcome. Thank you so much, Carl. It's a pleasure to be here. Terrific. Listen, you know, I, I I know that what you do could be considered niche, but the truth of the matter is what you're doing and what your company is about really affects everyone from consumers to brokers to general agents to insurance companies all around. So in 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 let's just start right off. Cody is an entrepreneur. And he is co-founder of a company called Snap Refund. And now, Cody, let's just start from the beginning. Tell us about Snap Refund, what was the genesis of it? What gave you the idea? Where did this come from and what does it do? Yeah, so Snap Refund was a company that initially came about because my co-founder, Anise Taylor, had approached me and he and I had known each other for a few years in the Philadelphia startup ecosystem. We both had different companies at the time we were working on. And one day he just called me out of the blue and said, hey, Cody, I see this problem where a lot of people in underserved communities have worse access to financial technology and financial literacy compared to their peers. So we set out with a mission as a company to financially empower people and businesses and give them greater control of their money. That was all the way back in 2019 and we had that conversation and we weren't in the insurance sector to begin with. So it's funny how life takes twists and turns. Over time, we were building a peer-to-peer payment app, but we actually realized that business to consumer and consumer to business payouts were a lot more antiquated in America. So from there, we identified sectors where there was an astute need to improve the status quo of funds flow and payments technology. And the insurance sector, you know, no shade to any of us in it, is one of those sectors that could certainly benefit from that. And that was what ultimately led to us becoming Snap Refund as our two products we have today, which are Claim Snap for insurers to help send claim payments more effectively. And then our new product, Agent Snap, which helps agents simplify agency billing. I see. Tell me a little bit about the beginning part, about the underserved areas and, and what that, what, were you, what was your, you were talking about creating a peer-to-peer payment method. And of course, what goes through my mind? Well, I'm thinking PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, even crypto, right? So what, what was your thinking as far as what you were going to do that was going to separate you from, from those guys? Yeah, that's a great question. So you hit the nail on the head, right? Those apps you mentioned are certainly the incumbents and they do really well at facilitating peer-to-peer transactions. Where we saw an opportunity back then was to facilitate some sort of micro learning where people could essentially learn about financial concepts and improve their literacy while using this app. And they would in kind earn in-app currency, you know, like a token basically and be able to essentially use that for, at the time you're thinking of high value resale items, there'd be like raffles in the app and you could put the coins in that you earn from using the app and learning about these concepts to earn these items that had high resale value, which at the time was like PlayStation 5s and Yeezys and Supreme hoodies and all these things that everyone really likes to flip online. Now, over time, we identified that hey, that's a really hard business model to support and you need a lot of capital. And not to mention, while we're doing that, we'd be taking a loss on the transaction itself because those incumbents are so close to the metal with the banking services they have access to, where an ACH transaction for them is, you know, fractions of a cent. Whereas for us, you know, we're paying like dozens of pennies 
So it was a tough economy of scale to bridge, and we identified pretty quickly that the model wasn't very stable. Well, you know, that's one of the most important things, I think, for any startup, is to be able to recognize when you're on the right track or the wrong track. And, and I think we've all seen the companies come and go, right? There was the dot-com bubble and, and everything that's happened since then. There's this strange concept that if an idea is good, it doesn't matter if they're losing tons of money, it's good, and let's put more money behind it. So I, I applaud you for, for recognizing that maybe that wasn't the place to go or the place to be and to, to basically pivot into something else. So you, you, you found that there was another area that was in need of modernization, and, and that was the insurance industry. So tell me how, how did you come across that and, and what, was the first, uh, how, what was your first foray into that industry? Yeah, so... We were talking to a venture capitalist um, back, you know, maybe a year after we started the journey in 2019. And we had identified already that, okay, we have this instant payment technology that was kind of the linchpin of our offering at that point. Uh, push to debit was a little newer. So we thought, hey, leveraging this in intelligent ways might be a differentiator in the app. But it was when we talked to a venture capitalist, they had mentioned, hey, you know, this technology could be applied in other places. If you thought about, other ways to utilize this expedited payment technology. Then we started looking into business to consumer flows. And we started out initially in the e-commerce space. We were helping e-commerce companies facilitate instant refunds to people, hence the name Snap Refund, which we've outgrown and is now a bit of a, an homage to a time past for us, which is why we have different product names for our, our insurance products. And in that journey, we start to understand, okay, business to consumer, is a very big problem space. E-commerce is one area where it has impact, but going back to the mission, like why we do all this, yes, someone getting a faster refund for their pair of shoes they returned, that's certainly helpful to someone, but is it the biggest application of a solution to solve that mission, to serve that mission? And that's when we looked at the insurance sector and said, wow, well, when someone needs money for a claim payment, that's a really sensitive time in their life, right? They might be out of their house. They might not have money for a hotel and the FNOL check hasn't come yet. So what do those people do? And we understood that about 70% of all insurance claims in the US were paid with paper checks still. So it was a very acute problem where the people who actively, actually, actively needed to get that money really had this vested interest in having it be seamless and fast. And that's when we started to look at the insurance space really seriously. That's how we got into the space. Hold that thought. I want to talk about that. We'll be right back after this. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the magic podcast show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the WindowToTheMagic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. We are back. And just before the break, we were talking about something very special. I, I feel bad. I had to cut Cody off right there to jump on a commercial. So let, let's get right back to it. Where, where, what was, what was that pinnacle moment for you? Yeah. So uh, the awakening we had in the insurance space, uh, maybe one of many, to be honest. There's always a lot to learn. Is that when we were initially approaching insurance companies to learn. Our approach was, hey, well, look, you have these slow paper checks. Why don't you just digitize? Like, boom, problem solved, right? Now we're a unicorn company. No, not at all. So the reality is we had to learn about the incentives of the carriers to facilitate claims processes in better ways. And I think a lot of that learning really started when I got connected with Moyes, Moyes the Woodbuy at Northwestern Mutual. 
Uh, at the time, he was the associate director of strategic investing for the Northwestern Mutual Future Ventures team. It's the venture capital arm of the carrier Northwestern Mutual. And a lot of insurance carriers, you know, we've come to learn have these uh, venture capital arms. But when I talked to Moyes, my initial thought was like, hey, Moyes, well, you got your sending paper checks. We can help you send digital payments. It's perfect, right? And then I give him the demo. He's looking at it and he says, hey, man, you know, I want to be honest. The branding and the messaging here, uh, it doesn't really fit with the moment that these checks would get handed out. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, in a life insurance disbursement case, someone just lost their relative, their loved one. They probably don't even have it on top of their mind that they want to cash these checks right away. They just sit on the coffee table sometime. People are bereaved, they're grieving. And for us, finding the ways where we can ultimately capture that person's attention in a tactful way is really more important than just making it fast. And that was one of the awakenings we had to understand, okay, based on the line of business we're in, there's going to be unique needs and nuance for each of these carriers to understand the best way for them to get the maximum value and impact to the customer with the claim payments they're sending out. And that was really important. And that kicked off a whole different way of thinking for us that eventually would lead us to launching ClaimSnap, which is the product that I was pitching to Moyes back then, although it was just a prototype, and then eventually AgentSnap um, just this February. I got you. You're right. There's a dif- there's definitely a, a difference between when someone's getting a life insurance payout versus someone who's just had a loss at their home when they have to move out and they immediately need to get money right now, right now, right now. So w- walk us through this because now we've got a little bit of background. We know where where this started from, what the genesis of it was. So you're 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 working with insurance carriers and you're working with agents and brokers to facilitate how money gets from whom to whom and how. Fill those in for us. Yes, absolutely. So our first product, ClaimSnap, helps insurers. And when I say insurer, who do I mean? I mean a carrier, uh, an MGA, or even a third-party admin. It helps them disperse claim payouts and premium refunds in a really efficacious way. So what does that mean? We make it so simple that you could either use our API to send a direct payment, or you can use the API or the no-code dashboard to trigger a pending payment to the insured or the claimant. Now, what these look like are email links that come through in the case of the pending payment where the insured can open it and say, I wanna cash this payment out via bank transfer, via instant rail, via paper check, which we had to add for compliance and regulation. And it makes it less of a black box. And that transparency goes a long way because people, it's no surprise, right, in general, have this distaste for insurance companies or they feel like they're being left in the dark on purpose or that the company is intentionally trying to withhold their money. And we know that these things aren't necessarily the case. It's more so that these processes are just complicated and take a lot of administrative work to to handle correctly. So that's claim snap. Now, shifting gears, what you mentioned about agents and brokers, which is really exciting for us now, is our second product, Agent Snap. Agent Snap simplifies agency billing. So we To fill in the story, we launched ClaimSnap in August of 2023, so it's been about eight months. We go on to win the State Farm Pitch Competition at InsureTech Connect, and agents start reaching out to us, start talking to agents. Carl, I believe we met you around this time, actually, because a mutual friend of ours, Teresa Chan, was gracious to connect us. She's amazing. Shout out, Teresa. And we start hearing about this agency billing use case where agents are saying, hey, this really sucks. You know, we have to manage all this work behind the scenes when we sell these policies. And we want to sell the policies. We want to help people get coverage they need. We don't really care to do all of the administrative work behind the scenes. So with Agent Snap, our product facilitates very simple agency billing workflows. And we do that through a lot of automation and intelligent communication to the customer in which the agent simply logs in and uses the agent snap dashboard to send out a link to the customer who's buying the insurance policy. The customer then signs and pays through this link. And then agent snap is going to automatically deposit the commission in the agent's bank account and remit the net premium payment plus any applicable taxes and fees over to the insurer upstream of them. And that process takes what's usually a more human manual intensive flow 
it makes it as simple as the agent. Once they send the link out from the dashboard, they can just sit back and go drink their Mai Tais or sell their next policy, whatever feels right. Wow, that's a that's a, quite a stretch. So either the my either go drink a mai tai or go sell another policy. I'm trying to think where 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 most fall on that spectrum. <laughs> Probably somewhere somewhere in between. I hope these days there it, it might actually be leaning toward the mai tai. I hope so. So you're so 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 the agent snap for for agents that might be listening. This is something that's designed to be able to facilitate the flow of money from the client to the agent, to the general agent, to the insurance company. And it basically automates that process, if I'm not oversimplifying that. No, you got and it. On top of that, you, and on top of that, you're saying that this is going to make things easier, not just for the agents and for the general agents and the insurers on top, but it's going to make it easier for the clients because instead of having to go through multiple steps with their broker, right, with their with their agent, which is their sort of you know connection to all of this, right, the clients talk to the retail agents, they're called. Instead of having to go through multiple steps, maybe there's an e-signing process, then a payment process, and all these other things. All of that is condensed down into basically one email or one point of contact for the consumer. And that basically triggers that. I, w- I want to get your answer on that, but we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, I want you to <laughs> confirm I have that lovely summary correct. We'll do that right after the break. We'll do. In today's uncertain times, navigating the California insurance marketplace can feel like a journey through uncharted waters. That's where Sussman Insurance Agency steps in, guiding you with the wisdom of experience and the care of family. We at Sussman Insurance Agency understand the complexities of finding the right coverage in these challenging times. With decades of expertise and a heritage spanning two generations, we're more than just insurance agents. We are your trusted advisors, your navigators in the sea of insurance options. Treating our clients like family isn't just a phrase, it's our commitment. We listen, we understand, and we provide solutions tailored to your unique needs. Why? Because to us, you're a part of the Sussman family. Don't let the tides of uncertainty sway you. Anchor your trust in Sussman Insurance Agency. Call us today at 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Have specific questions? Drop us an email at sales at sussmaninsurance.com. At Sussman Insurance Agency, we're not just in the business of policies. We're in the business of peace of mind. Sussman Insurance Agency, navigating your insurance life together. Hello, hello, Carl Sussman here, Insurance Hour. Thank you again for being here. If you've missed any of the show, be sure to check us out. You can grab this again as a podcast wherever you like. You can also find us on YouTube. Remember, we're always taking questions at 559-656-0317 or by email at questions at insurancehour.com. And if you do need something right away, you can dial pound 250 on your cell phone, use keyword insurance, and that will get you through to a broker right away. Now, before the break, we were talking with Cody and he was, well, I should say he, the last few seconds, it was me trying to wrap my brain around the the concept of agent snap. And I wanted to give Cody a chance to confirm, is that to, to reaffirm or confirm or explain it in his own words as well? Yeah, Carl, I think you said it so eloquently that I need to recruit you full time to explain it to people. That was perfect. All right, I'll take it. So I, I noticed on your website and doing a little bit of research that you've had some new partnerships and some more and some, I know you had mentioned getting the award at State Farm for an, for an insure tech startup, something along those lines. I want to hear a little bit more about that. But also I, I read that you, there was some connection you had with Guidewire, insure tech, and also with Ben Akiva. Can you explain what those are and what that means as far as, you know, trying to reaffirm what it is that you're doing? Yes, absolutely. So you know, moving past the State Farm Pitch competition, uh, that was an amazing opportunity where other insure tech startups, uh, including ourselves, all competed for this chance to get to present on the main stage at Insure Tech Connect. And going forward from there, we always had our eye on strategic partnerships. And distribution is certainly the name of the game in insurance. Um, it's that way with, I think, most verticals in general when it comes to software businesses, but in insurance especially so because the business itself is the business of distribution in a lot of ways, right? So our first channel partnership here, we've been accepted into the InsureTech Vanguard program within Guidewire. Guidewire is a very successful claims management system and 
uh, carrier software solution provider in the insurance space, they, through the nature of this program, look to promote and fund uh, essentially cross-promotional opportunities with companies where we can essentially elevate each other's abilities and satisfy their customers more thoroughly than they'd be satisfied without the additional startups coming through the program. So that's been a great opportunity for us. Now, moving forward beyond the Guidewire and Tech Vanguard program, we actually just announced our partnership with Benakiva. Benakiva is a very innovative claims management solution, a claims management system provider. They focus a lot on carriers. Uh, they look in the life space for some of them. They have very notable partnerships themselves. And I was able to meet the founder, her name is Bobby uh, Shrivasta. She's an amazing entrepreneur, very sharp, very knowledgeable in the insurance sector. And her and I, through collaboration, were able to identify this opportunity where their CMS takes everything right up to the claim approval process, but our platform is taking everything right from the claim approval process onward to payment. So it was a natural marriage there where we could ultimately help them go end to end with their customers in a way where the customer doesn't have to leave the Benakiva ecosystem. And we can use our payments engine to really power a lot of that value to really make it as seamless as possible for their customers. This is all just about getting money to consumers quickly. And I think you mentioned something earlier that there's this perception from clients sometimes, from, from insureds in general, that the carrier wants to withhold money. And the truth is the carrier wants to get the money paid out and the claim closed as quickly as they can because the truth is, a little inside baseball, the longer a claim stays open, the more it tends to cost. So you, your, your system is actually going to be being utilized not only to get money to clients faster, but it's also going to result in potentially insurers not having claims stay open longer, which inevitably ends up costing them more money, which ends up costing consumers more money because the more claims that are paid out, the premiums obviously get adjusted from there. So there are a lot of places that this particular type of product seems to be, you know, touching, right? It's not just the consumer at the point of getting a check for a claim or a broker that's utilizing the platform to be able to get uh, their workflow faster, but it really does get down to what type of profitability insurers may have and therefore what type of premiums they're charging to their consumers at the end of the day. Absolutely, absolutely well said. And that's one of the things that I think insurers can really stand to benefit from is when they just put themselves out there to say, look, we know what the situation is. People think that we're trying to withhold things from them and they take steps to fight against that narrative actively through technologies like ClaimSnap, through the right types of transparency. Then all of a sudden it changes the dynamic and I think insurers might be quite surprised at how much of an impact that can have on their bottom line. Absolutely. Well, for sure. Now, tell me a little bit about what it is today. Do you have a particular team that you have? Are you local? Are you a distributed workforce? Are there? I'm looking at your. I'm looking at the video here. For anyone that's watching the 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 video on YouTube, that doesn't look like an office per se. Can you tell us how how do you have all of this working? Are there people that are are they getting together? Are they distributed? How how is all this work being done? Yeah. So we're we're a tech company uh, through and through. So we work fully remote. Uh, myself, I'm lo located in Philadelphia. It's where I met my co-founder, Anise. Anise has moved on to greener pastures in California where the weather is much more sunny. And I think you and him can both relate on that. So out in California, Anise holds things down. He's in Anaheim, works a lot in Los Angeles for us. So we've taken an approach. It's myself and him as the two co-founders of the company. We have about six engineers at this point, and we have three interns as of today. So the company has been growing, but it's still a young company. Within that, we do things pretty nimbly, and whenever we need to get up and go to a conference, meet a client, etc., Anise and I take the approach of, all right, well, let's go do it. So this, I would call it uh, my home office, also my living room, also the place where I watch Netflix. So it's really an all-in-one. That would so t very 2024, I suppose, right? A, a, a little bit of everything from the same place. I remember when the when the pandemic first started, and I read this funny little clip online that showed, you know, this is what you do dirt, you know, for work, and it's someone sitting and typing, and then the next picture says, and now work is over, and they basically moved over on the couch 
and sat down and were still on the computer, right, you know, watching right. TV or doing whatever they were doing, which is, it's a, it's a bit of a sad commentary. And there's actually some legislation going through California that is looking to prevent that. It's, um, it's a right to disconnect bill that we're actually going to be talking about on a further show with the sponsor. But I think that what, what's, it, what's amazing is that you're able to put so much of this together and do so much of this, where at the same time, you are not all physically in the same place. And to be able to coordinate that takes work in and of itself, for sure. So I, again, I, I applaud you being able to get that done. Let's take a quick break, and then I wanna talk about what it is you see happening in the future. Let's talk about that right after the break. I'm sure many small business owners out there have been hearing a lot about tax advisory, but aren't quite sure what it is or how it can help. Let Semaphore guide you and help fulfill your tax advisory needs at SemaphoreHQ.com. A tax advisor is a part-time, on-demand financial expert who can help you with scaling and tracking your financials and making smart financial decisions. How do you know if you need tax advisory? The answer depends on your stage, size, and goals. Tax advisory can help you address these issues without the cost or commitment of hiring a full-time CFO. A tax advisor can work with you on a project basis, a retainer basis, or a hybrid basis, depending on your needs and budget. If you are interested in learning more about how tax advisory can help you scale your business, please contact Semaphore today at 720-766-8869 or check us out at semaphorehq.com. That's S-E-M-A-P-H-O-R-E-H-Q.com. Hello, hello. We are back. Carl Sussman here, Insurance Hour. Special guest, Cody Eddings from Snap Refund. Cody, thank you so much for being here. Again, if you've missed any of this, we've got just some amazing information about a, a financial services and insure. I guess you're fin sir, FinTech and InsureTech. You're, you're a little bit of both, That's right? That's right. For people that are following the buzz phrases. So before the break, we were talking about what is what is what what are your plans going to be? So where do you see yourself? Where do you see the company? Again, you said you're, you're still, you know, very small and young and nimble. Where is where do you see yourself in six months? Where do you see yourself in a year, and then maybe after that? It's a great question. So six months. Uh, of course, it's a great question. You, of course, there are good questions. I have them all ready for you. Yeah, well, I, I tell you, you prepared them well. So <laughs> when I look ahead, and this is always a, a funny game of trying to predict what you can predict and just appreciate that. Also, you can't ever really know. You just have to play your cards on a day by day basis and keep making the right moves as, as far as you can judge them. So six months from now, uh, I'm hoping that we will have our first premium finance integration launched and be live for Agent Snap. looking at having- Let me put a pin in that. Explain what that means to consumers, what premium finance means. Yeah, so when people buy insurance policies, right? Um, for personal lines quite often, the amount of the premium, you know, the amount they're paying for their coverage to be enforced is low enough or priced in such a way where a person doesn't need to take out a loan to afford it. But quite often when we get to bigger premiums, maybe you're buying commercial insurance for a business. It could be a $100,000 policy, million dollar policy. These coverages can get quite high, especially when you start adding multiple policies to the same invoice. And now I have my cyber coverage, my E&O, et cetera. The bill can get pretty high pretty fast based on your limits on your policy. Well, then businesses or people might need to take out a loan to be able to afford that premium. So instead of it being a pay in full where I just drop $100,000 on my agent today, maybe I could take out a loan and then pay that $100,000 over 10 installments monthly. And that's what our premium finance agreement is providing for policyholders who are buying insurance. So naturally, with agent snap being at the intersection of the policy being sold and the money transferring hands, it makes sense that we provide uh, really convenient methods and provide all the flexible options that someone might want to be able to pay for that policy. And today we have card, we have ACH, we have cash app even, but we're adding premium finance to the platform. And that's quite powerful because for those policies where someone might need to take out a loan to finance the coverage, them being able to do it in one consistent platform and not leave the ecosystem that their agent has provided them a link to can really go a long way in not only making the customer's journey that much easier, but also helping the agent just close more deals and win more business. And that is absolutely within our focus. 
Well, as much as it makes my skin crawl whenever I hear you keep saying take out a loan to pay your insurance, it, it, I, I just want to shudder because these days insurance premiums are, are, are definitely out of control because there's some, there are some regulatory issues that are, that are going on to, that, have, that have put some strain on the industry, putting it mildly. But I think that the idea that you're – now, there's no is – there, is there credit checks or is this, again, just so integrated in the system where someone has the option, pay with a credit card, pay with your checking account or finance it, and here are your payment plan options? Is it, is it that simple? It really is. And it, not to get too deep in the weeds of how premium finance agreements work. There's the collateralization of the loan, essentially. It's really unique in that the premium finance company is giving the pay in full amount, essentially, over to the agent or to the markets directly to pay. So the money is a lot more de-risked, I suppose, than a consumer personal finance loan, because if the consumer, in this case, the policyholder, lapses and doesn't pay for coverage, all the unearned premium just gets refunded back from the carrier, back to the agent, and then back to the premium finance company. So it allows the credit risk to be lower on average than it would be for a different type of loan, essentially, because it is collateralized so thoroughly. Right, right. So you, you, you take a loan out for a car. If you don't make the payments, they have to go and find the car and try and take it back and then try and sell it to get some of their money back versus something like this. If the consumer's not paying the amount that's financed, they can stop the policy effectively. And then whatever money has been paid, they have coverage up to that point, And the rest is returned right to the premium finance company as that's well. That's right. Exactly. Terrific. I mean, that's, I mean, it's horrible if that has to happen, but if people do have the option, it's always a good thing to have options. And cash flow is definitely something that is on everybody's mind these days with the type of inflation that we're seeing. And just like I said, the insurance industry in general is going through some, some real pains. As, as far as the platform goes, again, I want to get, I want to get back to it. I, I think the premium finance, by the way, is a, is a great add-on that's going to, the more options, the better. I remember there was this old Wow, I'm saying this old insurance guy, and that makes me feel a little strange. But I was a lot younger then, and this older insurance guy, I think I was taking a continuing education course or something, and he said, someone asked him, do you take credit cards or something like that? And he said, of course. He said, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to give you money. And that always kind of stuck with me that, well, yeah, it's hard enough to be able to find the, the, the client and get the right product and get them the right policy. You don't want any obstacles in your way. And if there are, you want to give them literally as many ways as possible to be able to pay that bill because you've already done the hard stuff. Let that last part, that uh, let that be the easiest thing. But I wanted to ask you a little bit more because I know you talked about the team and people that, uh, you know, and, and you, you've got the engineers and, and some of the interns. And you mentioned someone named Anise Taylor. Can you tell me, uh, you said he's taking care of the LA slash Anaheim area. What is, tell me a little bit about what he's up to. What is he doing for us? Anise, he is my partner in crime. He's been such an amazing business partner to have across this journey. So I'm the chief executive officer and co-founder of Snap Refund. Anise is the chief operations officer and co-founder of Snap Refund. Anise handles our day-to-day operations, finance, legal, but probably most of all, the crown jewel in Anise's tool belt is his marketing skill set. He's really adept at generating buzz, traction, attention, interaction. And thanks to him, we've been able to generate quite a lot of inbound attention our way. Uh, Last year through organic marketing on LinkedIn. Between the two of us, we were able to generate almost half a million impressions on LinkedIn, and that's not slowing down anytime soon. He's the marketing guy. Right. He's the guy, he's the, what do they call it? The, um, oh gosh, the, uh, what's it called when someone brings in the business? I'm blanking out now. Oh, it's going to bother me. I'll think of it, I'm sure, right at the break. But he's the guy that's bringing in the that's bringing in the clients. Well, again, the product seems to be fairly straightforward in what it does and who it benefits and what it can do for them. So he has a, he he has an easy job, air quotes, easy job, because it's a matter of finding the people that do what it is that this product is there to make easier, and then the product really does, I think, sell itself from there. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of the problem areas for you. I'm going to put you on the spot. So get ready. Get ready for some tough ones, and we'll get that right after the break. 
We all love children, and many of us have an old car, truck, or van in the driveway. Find the Children has a great way for you to put your unwanted vehicle to good use. Keep listening. Every year, thousands of kids go missing. Trust me, it's a parent's worst nightmare. When a child goes missing, every moment counts, and you need all of the help you can get. Find the Children is a nonprofit organization dedicated to locating missing children and bringing them home safely. You can help support their mission by donating your car, truck, van, or SUV. A towing company will come and pick up your car for free, running or not, and the donation of your car is tax deductible. Your help is providing the funds they need to continue their services. Call now, donate your old vehicle to find the children, and get free pickup. Here's the number. 800-403-6517. 800-403-6517. 800-403-6517. That's 800-403-6517. Hello, hello, and welcome back. Carl Sussman Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here. Remember, if you want to reach out, if you have any type of insurance-related or product-related to insurance question, feel free to reach out. You can call anytime, 559-656-0317, or shoot an email to questions at insurancehour.com. To get somebody right away, just dial pound 250 on your cell phone, use keyword insurance, and voila, you shall get somebody that can help you. If you missed any part of this show, remember you can grab it on iHeartRadio or on any of your favorite podcast apps. You can also catch it on YouTube if you really want to see what Cody and I look like today. You can find us there as well. Again, we are proudly syndicated across California on stations, uh, on great stations from KZSB to KMET to KCAA. Uh, to The Answer, to 860, The Answer, to KFBK, The Patriot, AM 1150. Too many of them to name right now, but again, I thank all of them for allowing us to help share our knowledge about insurance with everybody. All right, Cody, now now we get into the tough stuff. You have a product that is dealing with people's money, right? You're dealing with money that's either incoming for them if there's a claim or outgoing if it's paying for insurance. So tell me, how do you handle disputes or disagreements? What happens if a client says, I want my money back because they're not happy with the policy per se? What type of product of procedures do you have in place to deal with stuff like that? Yeah, that's a very fair question because the nature of what we're doing is sensitive. So the first step to resolving a dispute is, of course, having the agent and their client work that out because they control the customer relationship. Ultimately, we want to make sure that we don't intercede with the process that they, by all rights, are the ones who should be facing first. If there's a dispute there that can't be resolved, we, of course, would escalate into our own remediation where we can leverage one of the many tools available via the various payment networks that the payment was sent over. If for some reason we have to believe that the agent is acting in bad faith, then there's the ACH return code system that we can have the client, the customer rather, utilize to issue a disputed return to their account. Similarly, if the client calls their credit card company and says, I didn't authorize this, then the credit card company will step in and do what they do and pull the money back. But these are all scenarios that are quite fringe in these agency bill situations typically because usually when someone's approaching an insurance agent, the chance that they for some reason didn't authorize the policy to be purchased or there's some sort of weird scenario going on where you know they're not doing what they think they're doing. Those situations are pretty rare and infrequent, but we do ensure to the best of anyone's ability that in a situation where there's a dispute or discrepancy, we'll be there to satisfy all the parties involved as best as any software company could. So whose side do you take? Come on, let, let, let's get to it. Consumers, the consumer gave their credit card to an agent, the agent wrote the policy, and now the consumer's pissed off and he says, I'm angry, I want my money back. Are you going to facilitate that or are you going to have them basically say, are you going to basically pass them on to the different outlets that they have, whether it be, well, contact your credit card company or well, contact your bank along those lines? Yeah, so this is a lesson we've learned firsthand in fighting you know, various fraud or fintech hurdles that I think challenge any payments company is making sure that you follow a process that can't be exploited by bad actors who seem like they have good intentions. Now, in the case where someone says, hey, I want my money back, they ask us if we give them the money back, right? And then they go back to the credit card company or bank 
and then double dip and then file for return with them, well, now we would actually just be out that money if we didn't follow proper procedures and protocol. So when it comes to actually refunding amounts, it's almost always advisable for any financial technology company to have the consumer go through the appropriate channels to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. But in the case where there's anything that we can do to help assuage any concerns or lend an ear to all sides involved in a transaction, we're going to do that every time. So you're more, you're saying you're a conduit. You know, you don't get in, you're, you're going to, you'll try and tell, you'll obviously reach out and say, talk to your broker or, or whatever the case may be. But you really are just a conduit of the money flowing. You're not going to take sides. You're not going to be another player, in essence, another place that the consumer has to potentially deal with to convince, air quote, that something went wrong or that there's something that they want their money back for or didn't get what they want. All of the things that uh, you, you end up hearing at times. 100%. I mean, our role is not to be an arbiter. Uh, our role is to be a facilitator and to be someone who makes things easier and when it comes time to settle any edge cases, we want to make sure that we're not taking a hard line stance where we have to ultimately be the judge and the jury, so to speak, where possible. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, what what type of technology are you? Is this built on? Is this is this something that you are using any off the shelf code for, or is this something that's been built from scratch? Is it open source? Give us a little bit about the the nerdy stuff that that some of us out there like me enjoy. Oh, I love it too. I have my bachelor's of science in computer engineering from Lehigh University. So, you know, I'm always down to clown, as they say. So we built things in some of the most modern ways that I think anyone can build a payment facilitation company. And we're far beyond that now. Now we really are a true insure tech, fintech play, like you alluded to earlier. We work with the latest and greatest payment rails and security standards and encryption and tokenization along the entire funds flow value chain. So we ensure things with the way we do it, for example, that when we verify users and onboard them, we're not storing sensitive data ourselves. We tokenize it, we encrypt it, we pass it to trusted providers who will verify identity for us. We don't store bank info ourselves, right? We tokenize it, we encrypt it, we use a system like Plaid, for example, so that way, if there was ever a breach in Snap Refunds server, the information is not even there to be stolen by a bad actor that could be utilized to harm someone. And these are the decisions we made along the way to make sure that we modularize our entire code base in a way where there are these firewalls, so to speak, in place where each time we're jumping into another data plane, everything is cordoned off in a way to where no one's going to get anything they shouldn't have access to. And even if they get into a place they shouldn't be, they don't necessarily have the keys to a user's personal information, so to speak. Well, keeping everything separate is always a good idea, right? And, and, and you mentioned tokenization. And we're going to take a break in a second or two. And I want you to talk a little bit about what that means. We might be getting a little in the weeds, but I think it's important for people to know because they're paying for things online all the time to know how that is one of the methods that are that is utilized, not just by you, obviously, but by other companies as well, probably insurance companies when they're taking payments from you to be able to have a way of keeping information unique for each transaction, almost like having your credit card change every time you use it. Let's take a quick break. And then I want you to explain a little bit about tokenization. And you mentioned a company named Plaid. I'd love for you to talk about how you're integrating with them as well. Let's do it, Carl. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this, something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. 
Hello, hello. Welcome back. Carl Sussman Insurance Hour with special guest Cody Eddings. Once again, we are here for our last segment. Thank you so much for all the information you've given so far. I want to remind everyone, if you've missed part of the show, just go grab it on YouTube. Go grab it as a podcast. Just search for Insurance Hour online and you will find it. Before the break, we were talking a little bit about how you keep your data secure for consumer's sake and insurance company's sake. And you mentioned two things I wanted you to go into a little more detail on one, <clears throat> excuse me, is called tokenization. And the other one was a company that you talked about called Plaid. Give us a little bit on both of those if you can. Absolutely. So tokenization, this is a concept that really happens in people's day-to-day lives, whether you realize it or not, even outside of the internet. It's just simply securing data via a proxy piece of data that references or is mapped back to the sensitive data. So that way, when you are exchanging this information, you can just exchange the less risky token instead of the backing data. A good example of this, when you go and valet your car, they give you a tag, right? They don't necessarily expect you to use that tag to go do anything, right? The tag simply corresponds to the keys in the the lockbox for you. That tag is a token. It's a tokenized version of your keys or of your car by extension. So when it's time to go get your car, you give them your token and then the valet looks up which keys the token corresponds to, which is the valet ticket, and they hand you the keys. That's the way tokenization works with systems like Plaid even for bank accounts. Instead of having to pass the routing and account number back and forth every time you need to reference the bank, you get a token from Plaid or other providers like MX, for example, that represents the bank data, but it doesn't actually contain the bank data. So if someone's snooping on your network traffic, they don't see the routing and account number going back and forth when I say, hey, our system wants to pay this bank account. They just see, hey, this token, which is this like, you know, this encrypted or 256 uh, hash key string is being sent back and forth. And only internally within the source of truth, which in this case would be like Plaid, for example, does that party actually know the bank data that that token corresponds to? So the peep, so there is one other step, right? Between it's basically to use your analogy, it's the box that has all of the keys to the car and their tokens attached to it. So there is a party other than you and other than the insurer that does have that information. It's not you per se, but it's another party that has that. And and are these industry standard as far as how the the companies that are utilizing this technology and being able to keep that data private and safe? Absolutely. You know, that's part of the due diligence that a company like ours or many other fintechs go through when they decide which third parties to partner with for some of these services is, okay, who actually does things the right way? Who's an industry leader? Who's pushing the envelope on the latest and greatest ways to secure sensitive banking details and information? And Plaid has certainly stood out amongst that crowd. Uh, there's other competitors now. MX is another one that's become quite popular. And these companies do very well by their consumers to ensure that this data is handled in the right way. And within that, you'll see other mainstream apps. Robinhood, for example, they utilize Plaid for those same reasons. Gotcha. Let me ask you, let's step back a little bit and you look at what you've been doing and look at what you've accomplished. What type of advice would you give to someone if they were looking to start their own fintech or their own insure tech, or they were looking to start something in this same genre? What advice would you give to them? Yeah, I'll give, I'll give a generic piece of advice and then I'll give a specific piece of advice for this sector. So the generic advice would be always, always, always listen. You know, that, what does that really mean? It just means go in, you might have an idea of like, hey, it'd be cool if we were a this company, if we built X, Y, or Z. But we made the mistake early on of jumping the gun of not building what people were asking for. We had an idea, hey, this would be the right thing to build. Then we tried to go sell it, right? It thankfully wasn't a company killer for us because we were able to learn enough through like North Eastern Mutual, for example, and pivot and understand the right ways to build the right thing. But it's really easy to to skip that process because customer research can just be uncomfortable. It can be really laborious. It can be tedious, right? And you get happy ears. You want to believe that something's a good idea. So you talk to someone, one person says it is, two people say it's not, but you say, well, one person said it was, let's go do it. Really easy to happen for entrepreneurs. And then the more specific advice is, you know, looking at like the fintech space in specific, 
uh, even maybe getting in the insure tech space with this advice would be a lot of people have had an idea for a cool product that could do something as it relates to financial service or technology, and they go out and try to build it. But then they realize that the core infrastructure does not exist yet to make that product possible. That's how Plaid came to exist, for example. The founders over there tried to build what is now like Mint, or I guess I think it's um, become, I think they switched to Credit Karma recently. Uh, it's the company that lets you view your bank data and categorize spending, right? They wanted to go do that initially, but they realized like, wait a minute, how do we connect to people's bank accounts? Like each bank has their own API, their own way of doing it if they have a way at all. So that's an example of, which is really common in FinTech, someone goes out to solve X problem, but Y infrastructure does not exist yet to make the outcome possible. So then instead of building X, they just go build Y, and then the next company can come and do the thing that builds on the foundation that didn't exist beforehand. So when you're looking for problems to solve, I think that's a great place to start in fintech, is what infrastructure is there and what isn't. So if you're going to reinvent the wheel, make sure you've got all the, the parts to do it before you, but you don't want to try and start something where you know you're not going to have the component parts to make it happen. Exactly. If, if I can oversimplify no, it. No, that's totally right. I got you. And where do you see this in the next five years, the next 10 years? What are your, what are your big plans and where do you see this going? Ultimately, a snap refund is here to help people and businesses become financially empowered and have greater control over their money in whatever ways that can manifest itself most effectively. We're here to help serve that mission. And in the insurance sector, that's going to continue to be creating surplus value in the chain here amongst insurers, agents, and their policyholders and insureds, where payments are no longer a pain point. Things are as seamless as possible. And all the surplus data that can come with that can be leveraged for the benefit of everyone in that value chain. Beyond that, well, I guess time will tell, Carl. Cody, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I think that's one of the things that makes this so unique in what it is that you're doing is that you're not trying to create something and then convince people why you need it. You're basically saying, look, I see this need. You've told me you have this need and I'm going to build something that makes it solves that problem, which I think is terrific. I think only Apple can get away with creating a product and then convincing us that we need it and somehow it works just great. So with that, I want to thank everyone for listening. I want to thank you, Cody, for being here today. If you missed any part of this show, please remember to check it out on a podcast, check it out on YouTube. We are everywhere you want to find us. And again, I thank you so much for being here today. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.